Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Juana Bordas. Juana is a pioneer and thought leader in the study of leadership, diversity, and organizational change. She served as an advisor to Harvard's Hispanic Journal, the Kellogg National Fellows, and trustee of the Greenleaf Center for Servant Leadership and the International Leadership Association. The second edition of her award-winning book, The Power of Latino Leadership, Culture, Inclusion, and Contribution, was published earlier, earlier this year. In this book, Dr. Bordas examines how demographics and a number of other factors are positioning Latinos to be leaders in this century. She addresses how people of all ages can form partnerships and work together to build a more viable future. I'm excited to have her on the show to talk about the demographic shifts that are occurring in the labor market and what we can all learn from Latino leadership. So Juana, welcome to the show. Well, thank you so much. And thank you for everybody who's listening, who has an interest in leadership and also the multicultural age that's dawning. <laughs> Absolutely. And if you're not interested, leaders, we're listening. <laughs> if you're not interested, interested, stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, stay tuned because you're going to learn a lot in this episode and you need to know this stuff. It's very important. So I thought we'd start off to tell us a little bit about your background. It's very interesting. And I wanted to understand, especially how your early life as an immigrant uh, and Hispanic coming to this country and the kind of the hurdles you face, how you overcame them. And, and what about your life led you to this important work that you're doing? Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> well, you know, I, I I really do want to frame the immigrant experience, particularly since our nation, you know, as a nation of immigrants. And when I look at my family, you know, um, uh, people love. Oh, by the way, I have a a, a a grandson that's 26, and he says to me, "Tell them your origin story." <laughs> The young people are into superheroes. So my origin story is that I really and truly came over in the hull of a banana boat with my mother and six of her children because there had been a tsunami. And for people who are listening, I'm an elder in our community. So we're talking the 40s and 50s. So I'm kind of a little history book, too. There was a tsunami tsunami, tsunami that wiped out the coast of Nicaragua and so my father went up to the Bonanza mines to earn money for his family to come to America, the promised land. And so I came over on this banana boat and I say my first leadership lesson was getting off that banana boat because I had been in this beautiful, you know, kind of jungle, kind of Caribbean setting. And here I land in Tampa, Florida. So I say, I say to my mother, Maria, this is a leadership lesson. And it is because you know, uh, immigrants have to adapt. They uh, they give up their culture. They give up their language. They give up their community, um, the respect they had back home. And so my mother came here and she washed dishes, literally. She went to the Catholic priest and said, I can cook, I can clean. I came here to educate my children. And that's the other thing. It's that vision and determination. You know, nobody leaves their homeland unless they're seeking something better for their children. And so my family had this incredible uh, determination and stamina and this vision. And because I was the youngest daughter, uh, I had, you know, a sister who sewed my clothes. You know, they took care of me and they made sure that the youngest one, and I was the first one in my family to speak English. So I was another leadership lesson. I was a translator. I, you know, helped my parents with things, but they made sure that their youngest daughter became educated. So I was the first one in my family to be able to go to college. It's wow. a very long story, but I think what I want to leave the readers with is to really admire people that that come here and that, you know, they have such a strong work ethic as well, uh, who are here to make a contribution. And um, and so that's one of the things I, I really bring to the table because of my own background. You know, it's interesting you say that because one of the things that I look for when I'm hiring people, especially in my, you know, I started this company eight years ago that I run. I look for the number one thing I look for is grit. I want to see that your passion and your perseverance, you know, sh tell me how you've overcome adversity in your life. And I want to, I want to hire people that can overcome adversity and, 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 and actually become stronger because of those things that have happened in their past. You just told me a story of grit. I mean, you told right. me well, you know, there's a saying in the African-American community, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. Yeah. And there's a saying in the Latino community, there's nothing bad that something good won't come from it. So the other thing I want to stress is optimism. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, you can be in difficult situations, but if you have that determination and, you know, it's really also about vision. Leadership is always about vision. My family had a vision for me and yeah. they were willing to sacrifice, which is another, you know, a lot of times people don't understand the sacrifice. They were willing to sacrifice 
for the betterment of those that were coming after them. And I say that's the greatest gift of leadership is to leave a legacy for the next group that's coming on, whether it's in your business, in your family, or, or like my mother looking at her children who would become educated people. Uh, and by the way, we've uh, made a tremendous contribution. I'll just throw this in. Four of my brothers served in the military. My sister was a wave in World War II. But one of my other sisters did economic development all over South America. So we were always also taught to give back. And that. that's very important when you're looking to hire someone. You know, do they want to give back? Do, do they want to really help other people develop themselves? Because that also is a leadership trait to help people find their own potential. And I think I can find that in my own family. And then the values they taught me about hard work. And I always say, you know, Latinos are at a, at a very crucial point right now. We're really ready uh, to become leaders of the next century. And one reason is, is because we worked for this. Nobody yeah. has given it to us. We don't have privilege. Yeah. And so that idea of not only hard work, but having gone us and enjoying your work. <laughs> I love this. I, I come from a blue collar background. So this excites me because I've, again, I, you know, I, I, I love the idea of hard work, perseverance and uh, overcoming uh, challenges. And because I think those are, these are the people are going to be your most successful. They're going to be the most, they're going to be the people that are going to be creators and builders. And, and these are the yeah, people. Yeah. And, 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 and transforming work not to something you have to do. And I always tell young people, because I work a lot with young people, to really look at their passion and, and look at what they want to do and to think about, you know, what is my purpose? And, you know, how can I use the talents I've been given and what talents do I need to develop? Because for Latinos, work is how we contribute, not just to our families, but to our communities and the organizations we're with. So if you look at work as a, well, it's, it's honorable. You know, yeah. to be able to work, to be able to contribute, and then to support yourself and your family, to be able to give back. And so you'll see a lot of Latinos who are very good at what they do, whether they're a carpenter or a gardener or or a computer person. They want to do a good job because that's been instilled in us through our culture. Mm. I love this. This is so, it's so. Oh, so by the way, we have the highest participation of any group in the labor market. We love to work. Yeah, that, that is true. <laughs> and better listen up because in the next 10 years, 78% of the new entries into the labor market are going to be Latinos. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to transform America's work ethic. <laughs> so, well, that's good. We we need that. So <laughs> give it a little injection, right? A little salsa. <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. Um, what well, I want to talk to you about your book. Uh, so this is the second edition of your award-winning book. Come, it came out this year. The, the book is called The Power of Latino Leadership. So the question I would have for you is, why did you originally write this book? And now what can readers expect with the new edition? What kind of changes have you added to it? Sure. Well, I, I guess I should tell you a little bit about how I got in the leadership field, because it's. Yeah. I think it's an interesting story. I had been running this woman's center in the 70s and 80s, uh, called me Casa Women's Center. It is now the largest Hispanic serving organization in the state of Colorado. I'm going to age myself because it's over 40 years old. And I was sitting there for 10 years and thinking, you know, we have so many social issues in our country. And I thought, you know, women are still going to be coming for jobs, for English, for counseling, for um, we developed a small business center so they could start small businesses. I could be here for the rest of my life. And I thought, what is the solution? And I thought to get more people into leadership. Mm. You know, my definition of, of leadership is that um, that leaders create a society that takes care of its people. That's mm. what we do. Or if you're in an organization, they create an organization that takes care of its people. It's all about people. And of course, the Latino culture and communities of culture are people-centered. So I'm sitting there thinking, well, I could be here the rest of my life. And I get a call from the Adolf Course Company who had met with a group of Latinos who said, we need women in leadership, we don't have any. And they asked me if I would take the helm of, a, of an institute to train Latino women to become leaders. So that's how I got into leadership. But as I served on the servant leader board and I served on the International Leadership Association board and began to meet a lot of the leadership scholars, I would argue with them about what leadership was about. Can you see me, little me, five foot two, arguing with James or Gregor Burns? I did it. You know, he's the great person who coined transformational leadership because our leadership is about community. It's about uplifting people. Uh, it's also about enjoying life, right? And it's leadership by the many. Everybody has to contribute. And we do that by treating every single person with respect, whether they're the janitor or the IT person or the boss, right? The jefe. Yeah. 
So, uh, so they they stopped me, and 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 I have to always say that I don't think diversity is about race or or gender or age or or color. It's about your consciousness. Do you really believe that every single person on this planet deserves respect, and you get to have to take the time to know who they are, what you know, what they you know, what are they really like, what do they value, etc. So they said to me, you need to write. So yeah. it was at the urging of white male leaders that I began to write about leadership. And my first book was on multicultural leadership. And then I realized I was trying to set the stage for Latino leadership because Latinos have been here for, you know, 500 years. And uh, it is through our leaders, our relentless activism, our ability to work together, our collectivity, uh, our respect for each other is, is how we got here. And so I realized there was a gap in the leadership field. Yeah. And uh, and I'm not saying all the other theories aren't great because servant leader is great. And I take servant leadership and I make it community stewardship or organizational stewardship. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just about me and you. It's about, again, the organization, the community, the nation uh, and, and everyone that we interface with. So that's how I got into into writing about Latino and multicultural leadership. And it's a great addition because leader is equal means we're all equal. Leadership by the many means we all have to do our part and we all have to lead. So those two principles are kind of key to, to that kind of leadership. Interesting. One of the things you said, the importance of people, I think, I, and, and the, the respect and having respect for everyone. This is something I talk about in my book, something I, I really harp on. We talk about a lot on this podcast. And so really, when you say, you know, Latino leadership, I'm thinking, well, maybe we're doing some of this, you know, maybe we're, maybe some of the ideas in Latino leadership are, are you know, have come are, are similar to servant and transformational leadership, but it seems like it's its its own unique, like you said, community, not so much uh, just about people, but it's about community. There's some things that are, help us, help me understand some of the things that are unique to Latino leadership. Well, um, I, I have to say that, for example, um, all of us know that to become a good leader, we have to prepare ourselves, you know, mm -hmm. like even, um, uh, uh, Robert Greenleaf would talk about how we come to leadership in order to heal ourselves or to, uh, you know, I mean, it's that sense of and leadership being a journey of personal transformation as well as as serving and, and helping other people find their own thing. But when you look at communities of color or, or you look at Latinos, we also have to deal with being minorities and having been discriminated against. Yeah. We also have to deal with the fact that we haven't had privilege and, you know, and that impacts you. Um, and, and so we have to work through that and to understand that our culture and like the, the experiences I had as an immigrant are actually assets. So I had the privilege of being the first uh, Latina faculty at the Center for Creative Leadership. And what I say is that we got to learn mainstream leadership, but then we add value to yeah. it. We yeah. add more to it. It's really a people-centered leadership. And one of the things that is important, especially to young people, is that they do not like hierarchy. They don't like any yeah. kind of dominance. They want equality. And our leadership really is that collaborative sense. But it also takes down the idea of position, positional power, mm -hmm. that you don't earn uh, respect by your position. You earn your respect by what kind of a person are you? We call it personalismo. Um, you know, do you treat others fairly? Uh, do you do your part? You know, I always say Latino leaders are always going to be there on the ground. I've been told sometimes when I go give a speech or something that I'm the most undiva person they ever met because I'm down there stuffing envelopes, talking to people, shaking hands. You know, I don't want to connect yeah. because it's in that connection that you really, uh, you know, show people uh, who you are as a leader and also give them a path to follow. Yeah. So the the style of Latino leadership, which again is um, is more personal. It's, it's people centric. Does it also and get collective? And what's that? Sorry. And collective. Yeah. And collective. Yeah. Right. Does it get results? Well, look where we are. <laughs> <laughs> look where we are as a people. We, yeah. we, you know, I mean, I, I understand that, uh, 47% of Latinos are still working class, but we are really, you know, moving up. And, and here's what I want to share with people. You know, when you look at the younger generation, um, the majority of them under 18 already identify as mixed or multicultural. And that's something Latinos contribute to, to leadership because we're not a race, we're a culture. And there's Afro-Latinos, there's uh, indigenous Latinos from our Indian backgrounds, 
Yeah. Uh, 42% of us say we're European. You know, there's Chino Latinos, you know, there's Sephardic Jews that are Latinos. So we're a mixed culture. So we are really the paradigm for diversity and inclusion. Because yeah. one of the things about Latino leadership it is totally and completely inclusive. Everybody is welcomed at the table. You just make the table larger, right? Yeah. And so there's this whole idea of not having hierarchy. And so that means that when you walk in a room, you don't necessarily know who the leader is or who the positional leader is because, you know, they're just like everyone else. In fact, when I work with millennials, they call me Tia Juana, which means Aunt Juana, yeah. because that way I can still be an elder. I still have some knowledge to share, but, you know, they feel comfortable with me. Yeah. And, and, and so that's a very important thing because the younger generation is really saying to all of us, work hand in hand with us because we have a lot of issues and challenges we need to face today together. Mm, I like this. But one, yeah. one thing you just said, and this is, this is, this is interesting to me, you say, uh, that Latinos are a culture and not a race, and that culture can be learned. And you say that that opens the door for others, uh, that you can become Latino by, I don't want to say it right. Corazon, by Corazon. Your heart. <laughs> heart, by Corazon, heart. So how do how does how does someone who has, as we, we opened up I, uh, before we recorded, I say I have zero uh, Latino blood in, my, in me. So how do I become Latino in, in my leadership capabilities? How, what does that look like? Well, John, first of all, uh, I, I want to say that um, everybody who is Latino has non-Latinos in their family. Like my sister married this German. And before <laughs> you know it, he's learning the salsa. He wants his little batidos, which is his licuados at, at breakfast. Then he goes out and buys a piece of land because they live in Florida. And he starts raising mangoes and papayas. And he even has an iguana. You know? And he's <laughs> totally into it because it's a culture yeah. One of the things about Latinos is we have what's called a bienvenido spirit, a yeah. welcoming spirit, an open spirit. And I say that the U.S. needs another paradigm of what diversity and inclusion is and, and that Latinos offer them. You know, our core, our DNA is about inclusion because that's how we are a we are a mixed culture of all these different cultures. We only come from 26 countries mm. and we, we are intergenerational. We respect the elders, but we, we live for our youth. Right. And so what you have in the Latino community is a very open door to come in and enjoy our culture. And people are doing this. I mean, that, you know, tacos and, and Mexican food are America's favorite food. Absolutely. Right? And salsa <laughs> has been our favorite condiment since the 90s. But I think what we really offer is a new sense of family, of inclusiveness, of community, of the idea that connecting with people and belonging is really not only the spice of life, but that's where you really get uh, your your um, your inspiration from, right? From yeah. other people. And so we are a humanistic culture. Uh, we are a multicultural culture. We're an intergenerational culture, and we invite people to participate. And you were, you know, you were talking before we got going about going to some Latinos. Fiestas, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So one of my principles in my book is gozar la vida, enjoy life. Yes. And, uh, <laughs> and so Latinos spend more money on going out to eat, even on movies, on technology so they can stay connected, on food, on entertainment. We work hard, but we over-index and all of that because you have to, so you have to bring celebration to leadership. You know, you have to bring that 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 sense of, of of life to leadership. And that's what keeps people working together. And it also gives you communal memories, you know, remember that time and 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 when we had that yeah. and and it makes people feel very special. I always start my leadership programs with people sharing who they are, you know, their origin stories because if you and I sat for a little while, we would find those connections even though you're from another culture, uh from where you came from, we would find connections and that's so important today because when we go into a company, we don't know each other's grandparents. Right. And in generations past, we would have. Yes. So it's the role of the leader to build that sense of community in the workplace to say to people, OK, where did you come from? Where are your values? Who yeah. are your grandparents? Yeah. And how can we weave a, a, a new sense of community? So Latinos offer a new paradigm. We, we want to make diversity and inclusiveness uh, a core, uh, a core value of, 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 um, of our country. Absolutely. I love this. And as you talk, I, I remember, and, I, and we talked about it before we came on the show, is that I ran a, I ran a manufacturing plant down in Coral Springs, Florida. And I had, I had Latinos from all over the Caribbean uh, that, that worked in this plant and from all different cu cultures, all different, different backgrounds. But 
they, but it was so much fun. There was so much energy. People was a big part of it. Celebration was a big part of it. I talked talk about music, music, <laughs> and and we had these Christmas parties. Actually, the first one of the first things I had to do. This is kind of funny though, is that people were wearing high heel shoes in the manufacturing, and I was like, I love that, but we can't do that, and for safety reasons. But it was like, and people got mad at me, and I'm like, I know, I'm sorry, but it's more a safety thing. But it was, it just was an interesting place. It was one of the funnest places I've ever worked at because of that. Yeah. It was a high level of energy, enthusiasm, um, joy of life. They really like. Yeah, that, that's what Cosa La Vida is. And, yeah. and I say that it's a leadership principle that the real leader, like nobody wants to follow an uptight leader. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so, so, you know, you got to make, you got to make leadership. It's hard work, particularly if you're a minority and particularly yeah. think about this over the 500 years, our leaders had to keep working knowing they would never see the yeah. promised land, that they would never yeah. see the changes they were working for. And most of them didn't get paid. If you're talking about Cesar Chavez, the most respected Latino leader of the last century, who everyone should know because the farm workers are the ones that bring food to your tables, right? And um, and and he always marched, you know, with with song and music and, and they would be singing uh, because he knew and, and, and the farm workers who didn't get paid, they knew they would not see the change. And I always say that Latino leadership is like a relay race where one generation passes the torch to the mm. next, to the next, to the next. Part of the reason we can do that is because we enjoy life. Yeah, yeah. And have deep faith, by the way, as well. Oh, absolutely, for sure. So they did a study, the New York Times did a study on Latinos, and we're the most optimistic people in America. 78% of us believe that our opportunity to succeed is better than our parents. And I go, duh, I live in the best house I ever lived in. <laughs> <laughs> Eight of us shared one bathroom when I was growing up. <laughs> but I think the studies show that optimism leads to resilience. So the more optimism you are, the more resilient you are. And of that's course. those are the kind of people I want working for me. Or yeah. I want part of my team. I want resilient people. I want optimistic people. I mean, this is these are the kind of people that that make a company great. And yeah. and so yeah. this is these are the kind of people you want to you should be looking for to bring onto your team to help you. Well, and I I will tell you something about the high heels. So if I was gonna go out, my mother would look me up and down. She'd give me what's called the ojo, the eye. And then she would say, you're not going out like that. Because for people of color, and you can you can really see this in particularly with African-Americans that, that moved into the middle class, we dressed better than other people. Mm -hmm. We always dressed up because when you have that disadvantage of people, I mean, I had people for a very long time, I didn't know I was smart till I got to graduate school because they didn't see in me the kind of strategic leader that I really am, you know, because they'd never seen it. And mm. uh, and so th this whole idea of dressing up to go into the plant to work, it's like, I gotta look good because yeah. in that way, not only do I represent my family, but that way I bring pride to my culture and, and I'm more apt to be seen as yeah. someone who has something to contribute. Yeah. Yeah. I, I definitely saw that for sure. Yeah. And I, and I knew it was comfortable. And I think America could dress up a little more these days, don't you? <laughs> I, I agree. <laughs> and I'm guilty. After COVID, you know, my daughter, who's a lawyer, was saying that the HR people are coming in in sweats and she's all upset. <laughs> <laughs> that is, okay, maybe a little bit more than sweats, but you should dress up a little bit. <laughs> So one of the things you you talk about, I think is interesting too, is some of the generational shifts that are happening too. And kind of what are some of the issues, concerns, challenges of the younger generation? So what what as we see the shift, the baby boomers are kind of moving out of the workplace, the, it, we're seeing the demographic shifting to younger. What How does that change our approach as leaders? What do we need to be thinking about with more younger people in, in the workforce? And how do we prepare those young people for future? Yeah, well, it's an amazing goals. shift that's taking place because 10,000 baby boomers retire every day. And then the millennials and Zs are the, the, the largest generation we've had. So we're going to see this if, for those of the people who can remember the baby boomer shift. It was huge, right? Yeah. And so now we're going through that same kind of shift. But when you look at these young people, first of all, um, you know, one of the reasons I work so well with them is because I really do respect them. Mm -hmm. You know, my millennial daughter got on a computer when she was like three years old. And the way they think is so multifaceted. All these yeah. things are connected. And so they have a much, much uh, wider, broader perspective about things than we do. And they've been connected to the globe. I mean, it's not just uh, that, you know, studies show that they are connected across all these different cultures. One of the things we talked about was the dominance thing, that 
that young people do not want older people to to be dominant. And of course, that was true in the past. Children should be seen and not heard and that kind of thing. So um, so that really has to change. You have to really treat them as as equals and also check with them. I mean, they are they are digital, you know, digital natives. Um, and so a lot of times it's it's also like, you know, don't push that button because, you know, they get through it something and they're ready to push the button and go on to the next thing. And so when I tell them when I write, I check it seven times and have other people help me. They're like stunned you know, <laughs> because they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah, you know, you have to have pride right. in your work and you can't just yeah. do it that fast. And so you begin to form these partnerships with them around those kind of, of, of issues. Now, they're very concerned about social issues as well. So companies that are socially responsible, you know, their number one issue is gun violence. More of them die from gun violence than any other thing uh, anymore. Then climate change. And then not only college debt, but the fact that this is the first generation that's going to be less wealthy than the future generation, yeah. uh, you know, about buying houses and things like that. So I think really just to to work with young people, you really have to have what I call sort of a social awareness about where they are and what they need. But you also have to have a partnership because no, they're not going to get promoted in two weeks. <laughs> that that's an issue I've I've run into already yes. where a lot of young people are like, I want I want your job. How do I get there? And it's like, well, it took me 30 years to get here. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I, I love them because we have a good time about this because yeah. and when I tell them I stayed 10 years to build me Gaza and stayed seven years at the Leadership Institute, they are stunned. And I say, you just do the best job you can every day. The yeah. great leaders that I know have told me that. Federico Pena, the great mayor of Denver, when you would ask him, what are you going to do next? He said, I'm going to be the best mayor of Denver till the day I walk out of this office. That's how you have excellence. And so it opens up their perspective. I, you know, I go like, just don't worry about your yes. next step. Do this the best you can. And the next step will actually open up for you. I love that. I, you know, they, they always say the dress for the job you want, not the job you have. I say, I always say, do the job you have. Do it really. Exactly. Really. And exactly. The opportunities open up for you, and that has been my career. I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't aspire to move up, but I kept getting more and more responsibility because the businesses I ran were very successful, and I, and, and so you got more opportunities. So when, so when you do do small things well, you get opportunities to do more things. And I, I love that idea of do the current job you have to the best of your ability. I love that. Yeah. And and the door doesn't, that doesn't mean you don't have a vision. Yeah. It just means that. And the other thing is, is that um, change and, and you know, mo you, by the way, young people call themselves change makers. And the difference between a change maker is a change maker really believes that if they keep working, they're going to be create the change that they want to see. Mm -hmm. and, and I hope they do because, and, and that I think we should be partners with them. You know, I say to baby boomers, don't retire because all this happened on our watch. You know, you got to help us create a society because leadership is about that legacy. It's about mm -hmm. making the next generation better. You know, so I think for young people, because the, and they're also very collective, they want to work in groups and they're really good at that, about working together. And 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 I always kid them because my daughter, Paloma, who's a millennial, you know, she's in touch with, with people that she was in junior high school with because they have all these connections. And I'm like, if I, I don't know anybody, I went to junior high school, with, you know, except, but they stay connected. So they do have that sense yeah. of, 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 I, I guess it's relational. And that's very old, by the way, yeah. when a Cherokee greets you, they say, um, uh, in, in, in Katesh, which means I see myself in you, or you are another me, or we are connected. Uh, when Latinos give them each other an abrazo, it means we're connected. Uh, you know, uh, w w when you give someone a high five, you're connecting. So this sense of connectivity, which comes out of communities of color, and because uh, half of, of young people are from communities of color and, and consider themselves mixed, we need to form a new fabric in society where we do see people as, as, as you know, connected to us. And we do realize that our success depends on our relationships and and, our, and good relationships with people. I love all this. Nothing you have said, you know, as a 30 year practitioner of leadership, nothing you have said will not make your, your business more successful. Everything you've said is very important for leadership. So Latino leadership is smart leadership. Best, best I can gather from our conversation. Well, today. it's smart. And, and I will throw this in and it's called si se puede. Some people may know that saying, yes, we can. 
Um, because uh, Latinos have been marginalized and, and, and people of color, we do have a social activist agenda, which is lifting people up making sure people get paid well. You know, I mean, uh, we do have, and that might be a little, I mean, there is a whole field of study about social change study, it's social change leadership, but that really is core to us. But what I want to challenge you with is that's innovation. That's yeah. creativity. That's let's take a risk. That's like, how can we do this better? You know, because that's what we're looking for. We're looking for a society that really values equality and inclusiveness. And so we do have that that sense of, of let's change things for the better. Let's create a better tomorrow. And some leadership uh, uh, theories aren't, aren't based on that. I agree with you. And one of the things that we've seen a rise of is employee activism, where it is if you are not, if you as a company are not fulfilling what your vision and mission is, they the young people are be the first to say, this is, you're, you're not practicing what you preach. And 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 it sits wrong with them. And, and they they stand up. And that's something that, we as leaders have to understand that we need to walk the talk. If we say we're going to be, uh, we're going to be environmentally friendly. If we say we're going to, uh, you know, that we're going to create great jobs or we're going to be safe in our operations and we're not doing it, then people, our younger people are going to step up and they're going to, and they're going to hold us to the fire. And that's, and I actually like that to be honest. Well, you know, I, I've done work with some of the tech companies like Microsoft and Google and their young people are really moving them to be like Microsoft just got rated one by time for their social responsibility. And that's good for business. Mm -hmm. I mean, why do we want a society where people don't earn a good wage, where, you know, where we have waste or environment? I mean, and, and I don't even think people have even tapped into how the environment affects your health. Yeah. And uh, it affects everybody's health, right? And uh, and so I think young people today are, they call themselves change makers. And they really want to see a better tomorrow because they're the ones who are going to inherit. Yep, absolutely. So this has been fantastic. Um, what would what final message would you like to leave with our uh, with our listeners? Well, I do want to go back to your Latino by corazón, <laughs> <laughs> the Latino by heart, because it is a new concept for diversity, <clears throat> that we can all join together with a bienvenido spirit. And you got to give some people a little space to be themselves, you know. Uh, in the Latino community, you know, people really do, you know, they can wear their bright colors, they they can be loud because we're louder than most people. And, and we have to have that sense of acceptance and also that sense of joy in humanity that every single one of us is unique. I always say we are a one of a kind design, right? A unique expression of the divine, <laughs> you know, and so how can we get to that kind of society? There's so many cultural wars now and, and, and people arguing about things, but the truth of the matter is, is humanities is at a crossroads. And are we together going to build that better future for people? And I think Latinos really want to uh, have people join with us in creating that kind of celebratory culture that values all people for who they are. Uh, absolutely. And again, like I said, I think all the all that you talked about today will make a business more successful. Just in my experience in, in practicing some of these little elements that you talk about, but this th there's so much of this that's really important. And leaders, if you're listening in and you're saying, "Wow, this is interesting. This is this is I haven't really thought of it this way." This is why we bring guests uh, like Juana on the show, so you can get exposed to different types of ways of thinking. And, and again, leadership has many facets to it. This is another facet you probably never heard of or thought of, but you need to start thinking about it as we move forward. So this has been fantastic. Juana, how can uh, people find out more about you and your books? Well, one way I connect to the younger generation is I'm on TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so... Because, I mean, that's an example of one of the ways, you know, calling myself Tijuana, getting on TikTok, because that's how they communicate. And I'll tell you something else. When I started on TikTok, there was no way I was going to do a one minute message. I can do it now because that's how they are. Right. And yeah, they're not yeah. going to sit there. They probably wouldn't even listen to a 30 minute podcast. Uh, you know, so 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 that they have that kind of way of thinking. So I'm on all the social media platforms, including LinkedIn. I have a website, wannabordis.com. Uh, my book is actually, by the way, called The Power of Latino Leadership Ahora, the second edition, because uh -huh. I wrote that book because I really believe that Latinos are at the crossroads of power. And so th th they're welcome to buy my book on Amazon. And I have, um, after each chapter, ways for people to discuss and talk and share, because that's how you learn leadership. You don't learn it out of a book. You learn it by by applying it, 
um, uh, reflecting on it and talking with people. How can I use this? Absolutely. This is fantastic. We're going to put links to show, in the show notes for all of Juana's resources. Hit her up on, on TikTok. Watch her videos. I think that's great. That's awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, and again, th this is something you need to understand about leadership is you're going to have a diverse group of people that are going to be in your organization from all different types of backgrounds. And why not? Why not learn from the best of those cultures and bring that into your team? And you're going to be more successful when you do it. And uh, yeah, this has been fantastic. And again, the power of Latino leadership. Ahora. Ahora. <laughs> that means now. That means get now. with it. It's time. <laughs> so get the book, uh, follow the link, get the book, and learn about this really unique approach to leadership that maybe you haven't thought of. And uh, and again, it can help you to be a better leader and be more successful. So this has been fantastic. Wanna thank you for coming on the show and sharing. Well, I just love you perspective. and thank you for doing this. <laughs> uh, let's all work together for a better future. I love it. Thanks again. Uh-huh. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well.